Hey everyone, thanks for uh, thanks for the opportunity to chat here. Um, we uh, we enjoyed working with Inception on the the first parts of this, and we're looking forward to uh, some of the next phases. So I kind of wanted to go through uh, a few of the details of how we pre-train these models. Um, there are a few big parts to this that uh, were pretty important. Um, first, I'll go through some of our vocabulary selection process and uh, kind of our our aim for this process was to uh, expose the ability to align tokens across the languages so that we can try to promote uh, transfer between the languages. And so Niha already pointed out some of the, the situations where we've seen good transfer. Um, I'll show a little bit about the vocabulary selection process and then how we did some experimentation to suggest that there is good transfer happening. The uh, we use a, a technique called maximal update parameterization in the pre-training. And the idea here is to sort of carefully control uh, the, the way that weights, activations, and gradients scale throughout training. And uh, we use this for stable training. And it helps us when as we're scaling up to larger models uh, with hyperparameter selection and uh, making sure that we're sort of finding the optimal hyperparameters when you only get a you know a single shot at training a large model. And then I'll go through our, our scaling laws methodology. Um, we've used scaling laws for a, a long while at Cerebrus. Uh, if you have scaling laws collected, you can iterate at the small scale and predict at the large scale how these things should work. And we use these to, uh, to do some testing to decide, for instance, how to, to mix data in the different languages. So I'll go through these. So I can go through our uh, vocabulary selection process first. So the, the challenges typically here uh, in multiple languages are, are many. Uh, so the Niha mentioned our objectives were uh, Arabic modeling, great Arabic modeling first, and then secondarily to do English modeling. Uh, and to try to get some transfer between the languages. Uh, Arabic is maybe considered like a medium resource language. So you wanna try to transfer uh, knowledge from English. Uh, prior work typically chooses vocabularies just by taking the pre-training set and doing uh, kind of an analysis over the full pre-training set. And if you have, uh, we found that if you have languages that have lower resources, you tend to lose uh, vocabulary opportunity in those languages unless you try to balance during the uh, vocabulary selection process. So uh, our uh, our process aimed to to sort of overcome that. Um, we trained the vocabulary selection on a balanced data set that was a 10 billion words mixture of uh, data from both Arabic and English. And it was sort of curated to use sources that we thought would be good grammatical uh, examples in, in MSA. Um, we evaluated using a, a metric called fertility scores. And I'll, I'll show some of the scores in a bit here. Um, the, uh, after pre-training a few models, we were able to look at the embeddings of these models and actually measure and check for cross-lingual alignments. I won't show results here, but we did see that, you know, synonyms, uh, words in each language did transfer. So they're, they have pretty strong alignments in the embeddings. So that was really cool to see. And then we all also post validated by um, training some small models and verifying that the, you know, sort of the losses that you see in the vocabularies we tested uh, were just better. Um, so this is sort of a, a basic, uh, very early machine translation technique is uh, scoring your vocabularies using fertility. Um, there's actually a very interesting paper uh, at NeurIPS this year. I encourage people to check it out. That looks more at uh, a more advanced technique for, for selecting vocabularies. But uh, we started with fertility. Uh, the definition of fertility is the average number of tokens in the vocabulary that are required to produce each word in a vocabulary. Uh, so you need to sort of define the, the language's dictionary, uh, but then you sort of enumerate that dictionary and then just see um, uh, what it takes to tokenize it. You count the number of total tokens. Um, 
if you're doing this in a, a manner that produces uh, words, typically words in separate languages uh, tend to be tend to refer to concepts at a level that's similar across the languages. So, um, in particular, in Arabic and English, there is a, a fair amount of overlap, although there are some um, there are some aspects of Arabic that give you compound heavy compound words. Uh, which is a little bit different than English. But for the most part, there are uh, pretty direct synonyms between the languages. This can help uh, expose opportunities for transfer between the languages. So uh, I'll show a little bit of the scoring. We validated this, uh, this fertility scoring effort by actually training a few models. Um, the uh, fertility score here is just the vocab uh, score, but you want a score that's close to one. You want, uh, you're hoping for a single token representing a single word in each language, typically. So uh, here, the GPT-2 vocabulary, uh, obviously targeted at English, has very good English fertility is 1.09, and Arabic fertility is much worse. Um, there isn't, I think they actually did some cleaning to remove other languages. And so uh, the Arabic's fertility score is a very high one. It's a, it's a poor score here. Um, just to get our sanity around it, we use this metric to check uh, the code gen vocabulary, which is based on GPT-2, but adds code. And you can see that uh, the code fertility score here, for instance, moves closer to one, which is a good sign. Um, then we tested a couple uh, multilingual or Arabic targeted vocabularies to get a sense for what would be a good Arabic fertility score. BERT Arabic uh, did the best of those with a 1.12 score. Uh, we also checked Bloom, which is a much larger vocabulary uh, and contains many different languages. Generally, it does good uh, across many languages, though um, in Arabic, we did see that you know a targeted vocabulary like BERT Arabic was better. Uh, and so that was sort of our motivation for our trying to do our own um, uh, our own vocabulary that would target both English and Arabic and try to do it in a balanced way. Uh, we also added in code, uh, but we were able to score very well uh, as we were choosing these vocabularies. And as I mentioned, we, we have gone back uh, since this testing and verified that there is substantial uh, alignment between Arabic and English words in our pre-trained embeddings. So that was a, a, a very good, um, a very good kind of follow-up suggesting that we were on the right track here. Um, I will note that as we started training in, uh, in Arabic, we found that there were training dynamics that were very different than in English. And so I would encourage if you're, uh, familiar with training in one language and going to another that we that you dig into some of these. So just a quick example of something we'd seen. Uh, the what I'm plotting here are the gradient norms. Uh, so training dynamic a training dynamic metric comparing uh, pile uh, English training with the GPT-2 vocabulary when we see the red curve here has a pretty smooth uh, decline in gra gradient norms throughout training after doing some hyperparameter tuning. When we switched to Arabic, we transferred those hyperparameters directly. Uh, so this is training uh, monolingual just on Arabic. And we saw a very sharp dip in uh, grad norms early in training. It was sort of suggestive that there was something going on uh, early in training that we needed to deal with. Uh, typically, this is caused by gradient noise right at the beginning of training. Um, and that it's sort of oriented around embeddings, usually. Um, and so we did some retuning, uh, in particular, targeted at Arabic. And what we saw is we were able to improve uh, validation loss substantially by improving these um, uh, these grad norm dynamics. This is, yeah, so this is standard autoregressive language modeling, just predicting the next token. Yes. Um, so. There are actually some a uh, few interesting potential insights that come out of this. These are things that we haven't validated deeply, but um, would seem like there could be good justifications for this. Um, in particular, we know that Arabic has a few uh, characteristics that are a little bit different from English. 
things like the order of words maybe have more freedom in Arabic. And so perhaps this means there's a reduced importance on things like position embeddings. And so maybe we don't get as much gradient noise during the early part of training because of that. And then there are other things like character order, selection, and morphologies of the language where we do token fusion, uh, or sorry, uh, words can be fused or modified to represent different things. This means that it might be easier for uh, easier in the language to pick the correct token. So there's less ambiguity in token selection. That might also uh, benefit uh, reducing the um, gradient noise in the process. Okay, um, I'll keep moving here. So uh, to do tra stable training at scale, we use maximal update parameterization. Um, I'd encourage everybody to go look into this because it's uh, very useful for training very large models and scaling. Um, the basic idea with maximal update parameterization is to, to control training dynamics that, you might, that might cause instabilities as you go to larger scale. So um, models that are trained with standard parameterization as you increase model width or something, activations tend to grow now you get bump up against uh, numerical issues in, in different precisions that you might train with. So MUP controls weight magnitudes at the beginning of training. It controls your uh, optimizer step size uh, and it controls, uh, so on a layer wise basis, and then it controls activation magnitudes. And uh, because of this, you, it, you update all weights maximally, thus the name. So uh, this helps su substantially with stable training and uh, transferable um, characteristics uh, of the optimization. So you're able to transfer things like learning rate and decay parameters. Um, empirically, we've found that you can also transfer these to fine tuning from the uh, end of pre-training schedules. So that's pretty nice. And all you're left to do is uh, estimate things like batch size. So uh, MUP helped us a lot. It actually made our, uh, our scaling much more predictable. We, we reduced the, the standard deviation uh, around our scaling laws from uh, something like, uh, it was like one and a half percent down to 0.4%. So it was about a 3% improvement, uh, sorry, 3X improvement in, uh, in the variance. Uh, so this helped us when we were gearing up for our, our scaling efforts. Uh, in particular, we've used scaling laws uh, throughout a lot of our work at Cerebrus. Uh, and when we partnered with Inception, we wanted to make sure we leveraged these, uh, these uh, approaches. So if you're familiar with scaling laws, the, the idea here is on the horizontal axis, you measure something like the number of flops, the amount of compute to train the model, or you uh, measure something like the uh, the amount of data that the model is trained on, and you compare that against loss. And typically you can get uh, predictable gains as long as you are scaling, uh, scaling all the aspects of the models carefully. Um, this gives you very predictable uh, opportunity to decide what your target should be as you go to larger scale. So for example, in the Cerebrus GPT uh, paper, we, we trained up to a 13 billion parameter model. We chose that model specifically as a target because we knew we'd be able to beat um, uh, the Pythia models that were the, the state of the art at the time. Uh, we did actually beat that model and the trajectory of our curve suggested that we would also be able to beat um, the GPT Neo X 20 billion parameter model at scale. Uh, so these are these are just really helpful uh, approaches to uh, for for this sort of testing. It even gives you the opportunity to kind of back out down to lower, smaller scale models and do more runs. So, you know, if you're a, a quarter of the size, you can do four times as many experiments. You can expect that your results will be um, extensible and they will scale to larger models. So this is, this is the methodology that we used in um, our Arabic uh, approaches. So we collected some basic Arabic scaling laws. Here I'm showing uh, a couple different settings where we scaled up the models, just trying to get our, uh, get our basics in place. These are uh, Arabic uh, monolingual models that we trained first. Um, here we saw a pretty robust scaling 
both in settings where we restricted the number of tokens per parameter, kind of like the chinchilla scaling laws, if you're familiar with those. Uh, that's the pink curves here. Those are roughly compute efficient. And then um, we also trained on the full data set, which showed very similar scaling characteristics, uh, which meant that we, we'd be able to predict uh, how to go to larger scale. So reflecting on a note that Niha mentioned earlier, uh, when we went to 30 billion, the 30 billion parameter scale here, you can kind of see the, uh, uh, the scaling was no longer um, predictable. This was a model trained on 55 billion tokens of Arabic, but this model being so large, we, uh, we believe that actually we were experiencing a lot of, um, the model was unable to learn more about the language because there wasn't much information left in the data. So, so this is less than two tokens per parameter, uh, which is a very small amount. So uh, given those scaling laws, we were able to predict how things should scale uh, to larger models um, for specifically in Arabic. Cerebrus had previously collected English. So now we have kind of a baseline for testing. How should we mix the languages together? So when we shifted to multilingual language modeling, we set up this vocabulary. We started mixing uh, data sets to, uh, to try to train and find out if there's opportunity to get transfer across the languages. Uh, so what I'm plotting on the right here, I, I repeated the, the monolingual scaling law in red. We also trained, um, so we trained a few different mixes. And what I'm plotting here are the mixes that we ended up um, centering on, which was uh, one part Arabic to two parts English. And when we uh, limit the tokens per parameter, we got pretty good scaling. And you can sort of see it's a sort of faint, um, uh, faint here in the plot, but the trend on that curve shows that it's closing slightly as we grow to larger models. This is sort of suggestive that as we get to larger models, the model is better able to handle the mix and it's, it's sort of gaining efficiency in tokens. It's suggesting that there's some transfer. We went one step farther with that work and we uh, tested where we were growing the number of tokens per parameter total that we were training the models on. And we actually saw even better uh, improvement. So this is suggestive that there's opportunity to transfer between these languages. Uh, Yes, right. Yeah, so the question is if this is uh, autoregressive Arabic English. This is, yeah, so it's the same um, same task, just we're training with both Arabic and English data. Um, yeah, so the, the data sets were, we had them split, but we mixed them even within a batch. So, yeah. Yep. Um, so, yeah, I, I think I went through most of this. Um, one thing that we did notice when we were seeing checking this is, is the uh, there is a bit of compute inefficiency that the total number of tokens we train on uh, is actually larger than if we trained a model in either English or Arabic separately. And so mixing them together, there was some conflict, at least at the smaller scale models. Uh, but as you, like I was saying, as you get to um, larger data sets, and larger models, the gap is closing here, which is suggestive that we're getting closer to those uh, sort of optimal uh, characteristics in the, the, the loss trend. Um, so that's that's covers most of what I was uh, aiming to, um, to describe in our pre-training. Um, there are some interesting open questions that I just wanted to mention. So I think there are questions about how you should decide which data sets you'd want to mix in a cross-lingual setting. Um, our current hypothesis is that you want to try to promote transfer between the languages. And so uh, things like parallel corpora and especially corpora that you deem to have good grammatical characteristics, we believe are, are pretty valuable. Um, so we did some translation with the, the books corpus, for instance. There is some work to be done there since uh, translation can in introduce uh, translation sounding issues. Um, but we also uh, have questions around, um, can we better optimize even uh, our mixtures that we have today? So we're evaluating things um, on a per data subset basis. 
And we can actually see trends that suggest, hey, one data subset is not progressing as well as other data subsets. And so we think there's still room to improve that further. Well, that might uh, actually help us with this, uh, this issue of potential conflict between the languages and still promote good transfer. So there are questions like how much uh, you need to have enough data in the language. You don't want to have too much that you're competing for the capacity of the model. So pretty interesting results here.